Today's presentation is Common Clinical Pharmacology Problems That Cause Major Review Issues and Impact Improvability. I'd like to welcome you to the presentation, and I'll be turning it over to my colleague, Dr. Julie Bullock Sertara, Senior Vice President of Clinical Pharmacology and Translational Medicine. Julie, the floor is yours. Great, thank you, Suzanne, and hi, everyone. And uh, thank you for attending today's webinar. Uh, my name is Julie Bullock, and I've been consulting for approximately nine years, and I am the current head of clinical pharmacology here at Sertara. And prior to my role as a consultant, I was at the FDA for 10 years as a clinical pharmacology reviewer and team leader. I'm delighted today to be moderating uh, the session with my colleagues, and we look forward to sharing some common clinical pharmacology issues that we've seen in our current roles here as consultants and in our former roles as regulators. At the end of today's session, we hope that you will understand the key clinical pharmacology hurdles that have been seen in submissions that can impact improvability, and we will also provide some strategies to mitigate these program gaps so you can avoid these problems in your next in your development program. Um, next slide, please. Um, so this is the the agenda, which I, I've sort of covered, so we'll go through a variety of ClinFarm issues, and uh, we will then uh, have a question and answer period, so please, as Suzanne mentioned, um, put your questions into the chat. Um, before I hand this over to my colleagues, I did want to share an overview of our clinical pharmacology regulatory strategy team and services. Um, some of them you will hear from today. Um, but I think that our experience here at Sertara is unmatched, and we have seven former FDA, EMA, and MHRA clinical pharmacology reviewers um, supported by over 35 global clinical pharmacology scientists with um, scientific and regulatory experience and a variety of client programs. Our clinical pharmacology regulatory strategy team has provided unique insights into clinical pharmacology program strategies. We've helped with submission and document messaging and have assisted with resolving many stall development issues among other services. I am very proud of the dynamic and talented team we have here at Sertara and I'm a firm believer in the value and access to former regulators, um, and what they can bring to your development program. So I will now turn it over to my colleague, Justin Hay, who will provide an overview of the importance of addressing clinical pharmacology issues based on his published work while he was at MHRA. Uh, so take it away, Justin. Thanks, Julie. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Justin Hay. I'm Senior Director here at Satara and also former Clinical Pharmacology Assessor at the UK's MHRA and the European Medicines Agency. So the regulatory agencies sit on a wealth of uh, knowledge and occasionally they publish on the reasons that lead to delays or issues that are commonly encountered during the assessments or reviews. Previously, Tufiri looked at uh, withdrawn or refused applications over a seven year period at the European Medicines Agency, the EMA, focusing on major efficacy major objections as shown in the pie chart on the right, approximately 20% were based on issues related to PK or bioequivalence. Moving on to a more recent paper that was written while I was at the MHRA and the EMA, we looked at clinical pharmacology major objections at day 120. And so these were the first round of questions given to the applicant, and this was covering a five year period. For new active substances, the vast majority were due to issues with describing the dose exposure response relationship. Other major objections were due to issues related to PK in the target populations, analytical methods, ADME, and interactions. And these are all topics that we're going, we're going to explore in more detail in this webinar. Next slide, please. So similarly, for orphan products of the EMA, rather than looking at problems, another paper found that the determinants for success included several uh, clinical factors was listed here, but they also identified the need for a sound dose finding data as an important consideration. And lastly, when looking at over a decade's worth of new molecular entity applications assessed by the FDA, they categorized first cycle review failures, so similar to EMA day 120 questions. And clinical pharmacology issues again were included in several of these, including inappropriate populations, inappropriate doses, or confounding concomitant medications. And today we're focusing on the clinical pharmacology issues that may lead to delays and the questions that during a review that may impact provability. Some of these are unavoidable and which need to be managed, while many of these issues are avoidable and which, which can be, need to be planned around. <clears throat> 
before we discuss these topics, I'll mention that all the speakers are providing examples that are available in the public domain, and in most cases, we will not mention the products by name. Next slide, please. And one after this, please. So the first topic we're going to discuss is PK in the target population, which was identified as the second most common issue for new active substances in the EMA major review, uh, major objection paper that was presented earlier. While this may seem like an obvious obje uh, objective of clinical pharmacology program, it is absolutely vital to understand the PK as well as exposure response in the target population. But there are cases where the PK in the target population have not been uh, sufficiently investigated. And the first example on the left was for an orphan medicinal product. There were no PK data in the target population. And in this case, this and other objections led to the application being refused. In another example of a transdermal patch, skin adhesion, um, which could have, had, could have had an impact on permeation and PK, was only investigated in healthy volunteers, but not properly investigated in the target population, which was an elderly cohort. In this case, the application with that was withdrawn. In other cases, and similar to the first case, there was scant PK data in the target population, such that only single dose data were available and very limited PK data set was collected in the pivotal study. Ultimately, this and other issues led to the application being withdrawn. And lastly, on the far right is an example where intranasal PK data was collected in a healthy volunteer population, but not in patients. And this required extensive discussion with the agency and modeling to support the bridging to the target population. Ultimately, just because the target population is small or the disease is rare, this is not a justification to not collect PK in the target population. And in many cases above, the population, population PK analysis was used to try and patch over the proverbial holes in the application. However, this was identified by assessors and it's always important to use uh, PK analysis appropriately. So in the next slide, please, uh, we'll hand over to Krithika who will discuss uh, issues related to dose justification. Thank you. Thanks, Aston. Good, good morning, all. My name is Kritika Shetty, and um, I'm a director of clinical pharmacology at Sajara, and I used to be a clinical pharmacology reviewer at the US FDA. The second topic we'd like to speak to you today about is the, the necessity for adequate dose justification um, in, a, a, in development program. Next slide, please. The goal of any successful dose optimization program should be to identify a dosing regimen of, of your investigational drug that achieves an adequate, if not optimal, risk-benefit balance. In order to have the smoothest review of your dose at the time of marketing application review, um, it is important to, to develop well and clearly narrate the, the, the dose optimization story. In other words, it's important to, to clearly tell the story of how the registrational dose was selected, as well as how the, the data from the registrational study continues to support the appropriateness of the proposed recommended dose. A robust dose justification for, for any program um, will, will address how the, the dose is supported by five key areas that are identified on this slide. That includes translational data, clinical PK, clinical PD, as well as clinical safety and efficacy data, and importantly, dose and exposure response relationships of the drug with key efficacy and safety endpoints. In order to, to do this successfully, a few key notes are identified on the, on the right um, side of this, of this slide. Um, it is imperative above all else to have robust early dose ranging in, in the clinical setting. Modeling and simulation can, can aid with filling a few gaps, but it cannot completely salvage um, missing uh, good clinical dose ranging information. Um, on that note, modeling and simulation can be an important tool in good dose optimization, so we recommend you start these activities early. Iteratively update modeling and simulation analyses at regular milestones, as well as to heed the messages from, from preliminary modeling and simulation activities. It is important to have a structured presentation of dose arguments in regulatory communications. Um, and in order to do this, one of the, the, the notes we'd like to recommend is developing a dose justification white paper early in development, which can be updated as the, the, the program uh, proceeds in order to ensure that the dose justification is well-rounded and consistent at various regulatory interactions. It is a common misconception that clinical pharmacology reviewers across regulatory agencies review solely 
PK, PD, and immunogenicity data. This is not true. Clinical pharmacology absolutely cares about clinical safety and efficacy data as it relates to dose, and therefore we highly recommend you include these elements in dose justifications most certainly, but also in, uh, in other documents that clinical pharmacology um, is expected to review. Um, at least a high-level overview of the clinical safety and efficacy. Um, it is also important to see, seek regulatory feedback on dose justification in a timely manner throughout the program in order to ensure that the feedback provided by regulator, regulatory reviewers is actionable without too much disruption to your clinical development plan. Above all, it is key to note that inadequately justified doses can and do negatively impact an assessment of the overall risk benefit of your, of your drug, not just from a clinical pharmacology perspective, but also from the perspective of clinical reviewers. And I'd like to state an, uh, to share an example of this with you on the, on the next slide, please, Marcella. This is a case example for drug A that was seeking approval uh, in the indication of ulcerative colitis. Um, the first marketing application submission of this, of this drug was met with a complete response by the FDA due to modest um, treatment effect that was further confounded uh, by the potential suboptimal dose that the sponsor was recommending. A key element in this decision making was the exposure response analysis with efficacy, which indicated that clinical response rates increased. There was a probability for increased clinical responses with increased exposures over the proposed dose with no plateau, which suggested that the clinical benefit of the drug might be higher at higher doses. Um, the second submission or the resubmission of, of the application was discussed at the GI Drug Advisory Committee or the GI DAC, where the FDA continued to recommend non-approval of this, of this application. However, given the favorable vote at the, at the GI DAC, the drug was ultimately approved. How, however, with a dose optimization PMR to evaluate the, the clinical benefit at a higher dose. This example clearly lays out how inadequate dose optimization can affect the provability of your drug, and missing early dose optimization can significantly add to development time and resource at the back end of, of um, the program. With that, I'd like to, to hand over to my colleague, Blair Osborne. Good morning. My name is Blair Osborne, and I'm a senior reviewer. Uh, I'm, I'm a senior director at Satara. Uh, until June of this year, I was a senior reviewer with the FDA and the Office of Clinical Pharmacology in the Division of Cancer Pharmacology. Um, oops, okay. Uh, I, I tend to place formulation changes. Uh, I tend to place uh, potential drug development challenges into two different categories. First are those that are under your control. You plan if, when, and how they're going to be addressed. Second, there are issues that are always outside of your control. These have to be addressed, but it is up to you how you do it. I consider a formulation change part of this first category. This is under the company's control. We go to the, uh, no. Uh, the dose form and the formulation of a drug change over the course of development, and this is expected. The stage of drug development when new formulations or dose forms are introduced matters. Planning for a change in your drug can reduce the impact on your development timeline. The lot of drug used to run your pivotal trial must be representative of your to be marketed formulation. In the filing, primary evidence of your safety and efficacy come from your pivotal trial. If this drug is different from your proposed commercial batches, then the safety and efficacy of your commercial drug has not been adequately demonstrated. Your approval will be delayed or denied until this has been done. The amount of data required to support your formulation change increases the later in development the project is. Changing a dose form during phase one or early phase two may only require demonstrating comparability. The bar is much higher after the pivotal trial as you now need to demonstrate that the new form of the drug is expected to produce safety and efficacy in alignment with the clinical trial form. Next slide, please. These are two real examples. The example on the left is a diabetes drug 
where the drug in the clinical trial was analytically different from the to be marketed formulation of the same drug. The difference res resulted in a complete response letter being issued. The sponsor had to address the issues raised and resubmit the NDA. An approval was eventually issued, but it took 24 months from the initial filing and a substantial effort on the sponsor's part. The second example is a proposed biosimilar drug. In this case, there were three major flaws, any one of which had the potential to derail the filing. First, the proposed biosimilar did not meet the biosimilarity criteria when compared to the reference product. Second, the lot of drug used in the clinical trial did not align with the proposed commercial lot of drug. And finally, in a really unusual circumstance, the data on the reference product itself did not agree with historical bioanalytical data from that same reference product. This BLA was withdrawn. Uh, next slide, please. I'd like to switch gears and talk about QT prolongation. I consider QT prolongation an example of the second category. You have no control over whether a drug has QT prolongation potential, but you do have control over how you present the management of it. QT prolongation is an intrinsic effect of some drugs. It is not possible to eliminate this through planning. QT prolongation represents a safety risk that causes drug development programs to be discontinued approvals may be delayed, and additional studies may be required. Regardless of this, many approved drugs have QT prolongation concerns. So while it is not possible to avoid the problem, a key to getting a successful approval may lie in identifying the risk and planning for how to monitor and manage it in patients. Next slide, please. This is a recent example of an approval path for a drug with QT prolongation as one of its toxicities. The original NDA was filed in 2018. An initial review within FDA was presented at an Oncologic Drug Advisory, or ODAC, meeting. The ODAC is composed of experts from outside the FDA. In this instance, the ODAC members were asked to vote on one question. Do the results of the pivotal trial demonstrate that treatment with this drug provides a benefit that outweighs the safety risks for patients? ODAC voted against this based on risk benefit. The NDA was subsequently withdrawn. A new NDA was submitted in 2022. The submission contained a new trial with a different indication, a different patient population, and new plans for the management of QT prolongation. The NDA was approved this year. Next slide. From here, I'd like to move to bioanalytics. The relative robustness of bioanalytic work is under your control, but it really takes time and effort to make sure that things are done well. Next slide. I think bioanalytical work is an overlooked part of drug development. Having, a solid, having solid bioanalytical work may be taken for granted, but it really shouldn't be. The reported concentrations serve as the basis for the selection of doses and schedules. If you can't trust the bioanalytical data, how do you adequately support the decision? Bioanalysis is reviewed by the clinical pharmacology reviewers at FDA. They will consider several areas, including whether the method has been appropriately validated for the conditions of use, and whether the implementation of that method for the study sample analysis was in accordance with the validation conditions. This slide provides an example of some of the impacts of bioanalytical flaws. The, impact, the flaws may range from not following SOPs to not adhering to regulations to outright fraudulent behavior, but it's important to recognize that when the bioanalytical data have to be discarded, entire trials may have to be repeated. Next slide, please. Not every bioanalytical flaw is a disaster. Many flaws in bioanalysis are correctable with some additional work. However, even a correctable flaw will result in, del in delays or denials of approval if it's not adequately dealt with. This should be avoided wherever possible. If the method validation and the sample analysis reports are not submitted as part of your marketing application, this can result in the refusal to file. 
an FDA analysis conducted in 2018 indicated that there were 66 refusals to file based on clinical pharmacology issues over a nine-year period. So while this is really not common, this does occur. Even once an application has been accepted for filing, the problematic data may not be considered during the application review. They may simply be set aside until corrections or additional data make them relevant. The issues observed include not getting all of the samples analyzed within a long-term stability window, mismatches between validated matrix and study matrix, or poorly selected validation range for the assay so that they don't reflect the actual study data. These issues can be corrected, but will likely require additional data, resulting in delays for approval. Then, as an example, the NDA for FIAS was submitted in 2015. The submitted bioanalytical work was considered unreliable. A complete response letter was issued stating that the sponsor had to develop and validate a new bioanalytical method to address the deficiency. The NDA was amended and resubmitted in 2017. Approval was issued six months later, but the flaws resulted in a considerable delay for the approval of the 2015 NDA submission. Thank you. My colleague Paula Coppola will now continue our presentation, beginning with a discussion of mass balance studies. Thanks, Blair. So, hello, everyone. I'm Paola Coppola. I'm Director of Clinical Pharmacology at Certara and a former reviewer at the MHRA and EMA. So we'll now talk about the Human Mass Balance Study, which is uh, one of the most informative in the clinical pharmacology package of new drug application. And it's crucial to understand the clinical PK properties of new uh, chemical entities. So what information will you get from this study? It's usually conducted using the radio label compound and along with the non-clinical mass balance study provides essential information on the exposure of the parent compound and metabolites. For regulatory purposes, there are two main objectives. The first one is to identify and quantify drug-related material and to investigate whether there are metabolites contributing to the drug safety and that may require standalone non-clinical characterization. Then the second objective is to get an understanding of the fraction absorbed and to characterize the drug clearance pathway. And ideally, more than 90% of the dose should be recovered as total uh, radioactivity in the excreta, and more than 80% of the recovered radioactivity should be identified. Ideally, even for oral products, um, an MV uh, dosing should be used because this provides a reliable estimation of the absolute bioavailability and uh, of the contribution of different elimination pathways like the biliary secretion. Next slide, please. So um, these are three examples of common cases that may lead to major review issues or delay of marketing authorization. In the first case, the clinical pharmacology package does not include a human mass, mass balance study, and a valid and robust justification should always be provided in this case. So let's see which justification could be acceptable. For molecules like monoclonal antibodies or endogenous substances, it may be acceptable to not conduct in a human mass balance study if the admin properties of the drug are well known from previous data. And another justification could be that the data show that more than 90% of the dose is recovered in the urine as unchanged parent, and there is no metabolism. Another justification could be that um, there are data providing reassurance that there is negligible exposure or no systemic exposure. Then, in some cases, it might not be possible to conduct a human mass balance study, for example, for safety reasons, and uh, if adequately justified, a bridge with the non-clinical uh, um, uh, the non-clinical data or the in vitro data or other clinical data using non radio label compound could be accepted. However, if you don't get a full understanding of the elimination pathways, it's very likely that a strict label restriction for co-medication will be requested by the regulators. Then the second example is about timing issues. So the earliest you plan the human mass balance study in the drug development program, the better. And this will be an advantage for you because a complete characterization of the elimination pathway may be time consuming and uh, quite often additional studies are needed before the clinical pharmacology package is complete for submission. 
So ideally, the mass balance study should be conducted at least before the phase three, because it, um, if the, the late stage studies rely only on non-clinical or in vitro information, you might not have a full understanding of the drug elimination, and this could cause either delays in the regulatory review or make the regulators asking for post-authorization measures, which are known as PAM in Europe, and this will likely cost you additional studies and possible labor restrictions. Then the last example here is about the unique metabolite. This is a specific situation where a metabolite is identified during the clinical development, but is not present in animal tox species, or its exposure is much lower in the animals uh, than in humans. So in this case, the regulators expect for the non-clinical evaluation to investigate the potential toxicity of that drug. So uh, based on the FDA guidance, there are two approaches that could be used to address this issue. The first one is to identify an animal tox species that forms that metabolites at least at the same exposure um, as in human and to investigate the drug uh, toxicity um, in that species. However, this might not be always possible because it might, you might not be able to identify a, a non-clinical species that forms that metabolite. And so the second approach could be to synthesize the drug metabolite and then directly administer to the animal for safety evaluation. And although this can bring complexity and challenges, it's very important for evaluation from safety perspective. So what happens if this is not conducted? This will be likely uh, to affect the review of your data and lead to the request of additional studies or post-authorization commitments and labor restrictions. So thank you, and I will hand over to Eva. Thank you, Paula. So I'm Eva Gelbergland. Uh, I've been a scheme farm reviewer at the Swedish MPA for over 20 years. I will continue this team and talk about the value of knowing your drug elimination and how essential it is for your clean form package and impacts the risk benefit. So the mass balance study is essential, actually to such an extent that as Swedish reviewers, this was the only study that we by default would check, even in cases where we were not the rapporteur in the EU. The knowledge is central the information on primary elimination pathways coming from the mass balance study, together with in vitro data on the drug's ability to be a substrate of specific enzymes and transporters, and then a DDI study or a pharmacogenetic study, confirming and quantifying the role of the enzyme or transporter in vivo, sets the stage for one of the key clean farm tasks the identification of situations at risk for relevant over or under exposure. The impact of many intrinsic and extrinsic factors can be predicted. Here, PBPK can be very useful. PBPK is a modeling approach where we simulate drug behavior in a physiological model of the human body. The simplest situation is to predict DDIs with other inhibitors and inducers followed by pediatric drug exposure informing your pediatric drug development. But as science is growing, we are starting to predict the impact of renal impairment, hepatic impairment, disease states, obesity, pregnancy, etc. This information can replace studies, support labeling, or can be used to design your clean form development or individual studies. Next slide, please. Not having this information impacts the risk benefit. The impact depends on the therapeutic window and the ability to catch situations of overexposure by monitoring. It also depends on the expected target population and the therapeutic situation. So which drugs are your patients going to have and do you have polypharmacy? A situation where you're not able to predict your victim DDIs is difficult to resolve based on general DDI statements in the labeling. Usually insufficient information is or in organ impairment is easier to handle in the labeling, but in real life, this depends on the clinical need as you may have off-label use. Unknown or difficult to manage DDI risk can also impact a product's viability post-approval. 
The cases to the right are all drugs that were withdrawn from the market due to severe DDI consequences. To illustrate the impact of benefit risk, I've included two examples, one on DDI and one on renal impairment. The first case illustrates how lack of knowledge of major enzymes and transporters involved not enabling victim DDI predictions can impact the benefit risk assessment. This is an extract of the public EU assessment report, the EPAR. This drug was not approved, not only because of this, but it did have an impact on the risk benefit. The next example is a narrow therapeutic index drugs with 90% renal excretion. Here, exposure starts to increase already in mild renal impairment, the same decrease in renal function as you can see in the elderly. The safety in the elderly was questioned, and this was part of the grounds for refusal in the first marketing application, which was rejected. In EU, you can ask for a re-examination after rejection, and this was done. Here, the product was approved, but use in renal impairment was not allowed. In the elderly, investigation of renal function was mandatory before starting treatment, and the renal function was monitored throughout treatment in all patients. A PAM was issued to investigate suitable dose in mild renal impairment. In conclusion to these slides, elimination knowledge is key. It sets the stage of the ClinFarm development plan and enables valuable simulations of situations at risk, informing both your clinical protocols, your plans and labeling. Lack of this information also impacts the benefit risk of your application. I'm coming back to the comments from Blair. Not having this information is something you can avoid. Don't put yourself in a situation not having it. Instead, understand your elimination in time and benefit from your knowledge. With this, I will give the floor back to Julie for closing comments. Thank you, Ava. Um, so uh, lots of wonderful things to talk about and think about. I mean, that's the, the, the complexity of clinical pharmacology and why I think it's so important to work with former regulators. Is we have a lot of different discipline specific issues that can come up in our, in our development and the clinical pharmacology development plans can be um, very complex and they need to work in context with our safety and efficacy plans as well. Um, so with that, we will close the official presentation part of today's webinar and we'll now move into the panel discussion. So we have, um, you know, a little over 20 minutes to spend uh, answering questions. So if the rest of my, you can uh, stop the presentation now and the rest of my uh, panelists can show up on screen, we can work, we can go into question and answer. Very good. And thank you to those who have um, put questions into the chat box. We, we appreciate those. Um, so I'm going to start the first question uh, for either uh, Krithika or Paula, um, either or can, can answer these. Uh, so are human AME studies required or necessary, or do you find them useful for antibody drug conjugates, um, specifically for the payload of the ADC? So either one of you would like to answer that. Um, I'll, I'll take a stab and then Paula, it, it, it's useful to have you jump in as well. Um, while AME information is, is really important, um, per the guidance for, for EDCs in particular, um, it's been historically challenging um, and, and technically difficult to have a human AME study um, for, for, uh, for, for ADCs and certainly for the, for the payloads, which can be very, very potent. Historically, review decisions have relied fairly heavily on non-clinical AME, um, which while useful still leaves some gaps. Um, what has been, however, useful as a, as a, as a substitute is trying to do some, some early collection of urine and feces data in the first human study, um, if feasible, 
as well as some called MedID work in, in early um, first and human programs for, for ADCs. Not all of the, the approved ones have consistently done this, but whenever that information was available, it was very helpful to, to aid review decisions for ADCs. Um, Paula? Yes, so thanks, Kritika. Uh, I, I would agree with you. It's, I think it's quite challenging in this case. And um, uh, I think that as long as uh, information can be obtained from other studies uh, in terms of the, the eliminations, um, and so if uh, uh, PK has been well characterized, as you said, in the first in human or uh, in other studies, um, urine uh, have been collected, so there is an understanding of the elimination and uh, the ADMI properties, then uh, it might be justified to not have uh, um, dedicated any, any study. Very good, thank you both. Um, so another question that came through, um, and I will, I'll answer it from the FDA side, but I'll be curious to hear from Ava, Justin, and Paolo on the, the EMA side, um, is with regards to absolute bioavailability. So um, is, it an, uh, is it a requirement? Uh, and if, if it is, has any application been refused to file based on absolute bioavailability, absence of that? Um, so, from the FDA perspective, you know, I've worked on a number of NDAs, uh, both externally as well as internally at the agency, and I'm trying to think of some of the examples, at least in the oncology space, that even had absolute bioavailability, and the answer was it's pretty rare um, because we usually don't develop those types of formulations uh, to, to look at that, um, that parameter. Uh, relative bioavailability obviously is relatively common as we switch formulations or we move from oral solid oral dosage forms into liquid for peas, but absolute um, is, is pretty rare. So I would say um, definitively that no, an absence of that is not a refuse to file issue from the FDA side. So um, Ava, Justin, or Paula, do you have any comments about the, the other side of the pond, how they would um, look at that? Yeah, I can I can start, Julie. So I completely agree with you there. I mean, it's it can be very useful information, but not having it uh, is not going to be an issue that will not lead to approval. So I think that you're completely right. I think sometimes uh, it can really help in formulation bridging. Let's say that you're bridging to an IV formulation, for example, that then in those cases can help you to have less PK data. But uh, absolutely, otherwise it's good to have, and it's very good to have for modeling purposes as well, but it's never a reason not to approve a drug. Yeah. Um, so another question that we got from our, our, our audience is, and I'm not sure who specifically would like to, to, to answer this one. It could fall into to you, Ava, because it's about unique metabolites. Um, so how can I proceed if I find a unique metabolite in humans, but it's a glucuronide and it's unlikely active? Um, so I'm guessing then in this situation, this unique metabolite has not been characterized in, in the non-clinical species. So um, what would you do in that situation, Ava? With some of the yes, considerations, I, I guess. Yeah, yeah so, so uh, I think this is more of a DMP question, but... Um, I am, um, yeah, so so I don't know if someone else should try to answer this one instead or if we should come back on this one. I think that when it comes to glucuronides that you are you don't have to go further and characterize it in preclinical animals, but I am not 100% sure there, so I would have to come back on that. Yeah, so this is a, a great, uh, actually, educational moment with regards to how clinical pharmacology often has to rely on 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 our DMPK colleagues, as well as our non-clinical colleagues, um, really to, to decide how we're going to approach some of these, these, these unique metabolites. And I would also say that another um, issue where we usually have to start collaborating with non-clinical colleagues, as well as when we're thinking about using healthy volunteers for like anti-cancer drugs, right? So um, a lot of these questions come to us but as clinical pharmacologists alone, we often can't answer them. We're usually trying to phone a friend uh, from our, our nearest, uh, our, our other colleagues in other disciplines. So unless others have question, uh, specific answers to this question, um, maybe we'll, we'll move on and, and think about, let's talk a little bit about dose. Um, so lots of questions coming through about dose, and I had some that were specifically asking about oncology, but I'd like to keep this relatively broader. 
um, than just thinking about dose optimization for oncology. So, um, Krithika, can you elaborate on how modeling and simulation can be used in dose justification for rare diseases where there's limited patient populations? Right. Um, thank you for this, this question. It's an important one. Um, well, I know the question was about modeling, but I, I'll start with saying that even in, in rare indications, it's it's useful and very informative to the modeling um, to have information across the spread of at least two or three different doses. If there's 10 patients available for the study, um, it's worthwhile not putting all 10 in at one dose level, but trying to collect information um, across a few. Um, once that early dose ranging information is available, um, exposure response, uh, some of the more well socialized approaches like pop, uh, pop, uh, pop and exposure response can be used to great effect to try and help us understand which uh, exposure range or dose range um, um, seems uh, to be the most um, useful from a, from a clinical benefit perspective. Uh, PBPK, for example, has been very frequently and um, uh, successfully used to, to determine starting doses for, for example, rare populations that are also pediatric populations, which is quite commonly what the, the rare populations are. Um, there's also emerging um, um, approaches, including QSP, which have been used um, quite effectively to help with determining doses. I think uh, one of the precedents might be for Natbara, I'm pretty sure I'm mispronouncing that, but um, it was a, a parathyroid hormone compound um, that used QSP to help identify an appropriate starting dose. Um, additional approaches that help us integrate real-world evidence or information from EAP programs um, into, into dose selection um, for rare populations are also starting um, uh, to be used, even though their, their regulatory adoption will um, inevitably lag a little bit behind. Um, so it's there's several new new approaches and several um, well-established ones that are useful for, for dose optimization in, in rare pediatric, um, rare or pediatric and or pediatric indications. Um, we're happy to, to discuss more specifics depending on the on the case. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Kritika. Um, so, a uh, question about QT. So, we'll, we'll give this one to Blair since you presented on QT today, but all of us, I'm sure, have gotten this question over some part of our career. Um, so, is a thorough QT study always required prior to filing for marketing approval? And it, that's actually, it's a great question, and the answer is no. Um, if you have another mechanism that you would like to propose to FDA, to address QT issues, you can propose something um, and send it in and avoid doing a thorough QT study. Um, this is particularly true in oncology where you have alternate approaches that are considered acceptable. You cannot avoid addressing the question, but you have some choices in how you're going to approach doing it. Are there other Thank comments you, Blair. people would like to add? Yeah. Anybody else? Okay. So we'll we'll move on. So the next question um, is a bioanalytical question. Um, so again, maybe this can go back to you, Blair, or, or some of the others who who like bioanalytical. So what happens if a portion of your bioanalytical data are excluded because sample analysis? was not conducted in compliance with the assay validation. So I get this a lot. Like, do we exclude those, those samples from the pot PK and exposure response? Like, how do we approach some of that from a data analysis perspective? And how is that viewed if we have a large chunk of data that's not uh, capable of being analyzed? How is that viewed from an, an, a regulatory perspective? Well, obviously, anytime you have to, you can't, don't think the data are reliable. It's a problem from a regulatory perspective. That doesn't mean that it is necessarily a fatal flaw. It depends on how much of your data have to be excluded and what those data are. If you can, if a regulator could draw an adequate uh, understanding without those data, it may be possible to proceed without correcting the flaw. Otherwise, you know, so if it's if it's an early on study, but you've got similar data later, you may be able to proceed without doing anything. However, in many cases, that's not true. 
And in those cases, you may have to go through and if the problem is that you are outside of a stability window or the range of your analyzed samples is outside of your validated range, you may simply have to redo parts of your validation or put long-term stability information in and present that information to FDA and then be able to work your data set back into place. Um, in most extreme cases, you may have to repeat a study, and there certainly have been studies along the way where the bioanalytical data was simply unsuitable, and the studies did have to be, did have to be repeated. Um, the best choice that you've got is to avoid getting into the situation in the first place if you possibly can. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we've got just a, a couple more minutes left, and so I'm going to ask maybe two more questions. Um, one is uh, going to be human ADME related. So Paola, um, in a case where the mass balance study in healthy volunteers shows that the circulating active radioactivity is mostly accounted for parents, but the study in renal impairment pa uh, patients um, and metabolite exposure is higher. Um, what data would you might would might be requested from from a regulator? Okay, thanks, Julie. So I think this is a really good question. So um, I, I would assume that from the mass balance study, uh, the metabolite was measured and the exposure was minimal in that case. And so in general, the mass balance study is conducted in hum in uh, healthy volunteers. And uh, then based on the data in this population, uh, consideration can be done in terms of the expected exposure in other population, like special population or patients. However, uh, as in this case, it might happen that the metabolites become more important in special population. And so uh, supportive evidences are needed to provide reassurance uh, from a safety perspective. And so the metabolite, first of all, should be characterized, adequate, adequately characterized in uh, the non-clinical uh, toxicological um, studies, so in uh, animal species. And uh, in terms of the um, special population, so in this case, the renal impairment, um, the contribution of these metabolites to the pharmacological activity should be evaluated and investigated, and uh, the exposure response relationship could be used to support uh, this evaluation and to provide reassurance uh, in this specific population. Thank you, Paola. Um, so we have time for a couple more questions. Um, so I have a question that came in for, uh, for Justin. So what are some of the instances where bridge, um, bringing PK from healthy volunteer uh, patient populations, um, I'm assuming it's bringing PK from healthy volunteers to patient populations may be more acceptable. Um, so when can we use both of those PK populations in our, in our analysis? Because you, you mentioned the, in your talk about not having enough from the patient population. So um, when can we use healthy? Yeah. I would say, I mean, you generally always use the healthy patient population, uh, healthy volunteer data, um, it's going to it's going to help contribute at least to looking at covariates um, in the in population um, PK modelling. Um, it, it will de really depend on what what the target population is um, and how that how that differs to the to the healthy volunteers. I mean, of course, if if, if it's a, a um, poor, you know, very different. Um, if you if you have a sort of, sort of otherwise healthy um, Patient populations, no, no uh, renal complications, or so. Then, of course, you can you can easily bridge it. Um, of course, but there's there's many gradients along the way there between well, healthy volunteers and patients. So it will depend on a case by case um, situation. But um, I think you would try and include it as in as many um, situations as possible, uh, at least in your in your pop PK modelling to help with the covariate analysis. Yeah, absolutely. No, I agree. Um, and that's actually part of kind of the pot PK is to pick up any difference between these two populations. So um, definitely still important to include the data and whether or not you include all of it or just parts of it, I think is really driven by the modeling. Um, so the last question, which is going to be a little bit for everybody. Um, so you know, what is the, the best way to present problematic data to the regulatory agencies? So um, this is <laughs> this is really tricky. Um, so I'll, I'm going to start. Uh, so my advice is to first to to not bury it. 
um, because it will be found. Uh, and if the ag agency finds it and you didn't talk about it, um, it does have the tendency to make them dig into even more things to try to find other things that were hidden. Um, so, so my advice is always, if you have a problem with your data, to be forthcoming about it and and really talk about, you know, what are the limitations um, that that data that that problem has to the overall program. So I don't know if any. I saw some nodding heads uh, with my answers. So I don't know if anybody else has had some pearls of wisdom there. Um, yeah, yeah, I can, I can fully agree with you, Julie. I think that is really key to explain. Uh, the full scenario and why you're asking a certain question to the regulators. And I know as regulator, having been in many advice situations where you actually realize in the meeting, having the complete data set, why that question was so difficult and why there was a need to ask it. So, um, yeah, I completely agree. I mean, you want to have the uh, full, fully informed regulatory opinion. Uh, on your data set, so you should actually you should be as as clear as possible on the full scenario. Yeah. Don't jump Anybody in there. Else? I was going to say, I yeah, fully, fully echo your comments, there, Julie. Yeah, the, you need to the problematic data definitely need to discuss, um, but also gaps in um, in data as well. I think you know if if there is a dare I say an obvious either a, um, a study or so that's missing. Um, if it's that big or even just gaps in in s certain amounts of information perhaps going back to Blair you know if there's analytical data that's just missing or has to be excluded um, that that should be um, discussed as well and it, it should be yes yeah, there should be a scientific discussion rationale for it but also the, what, what consequence it has for um, for the program yeah Absolutely. so anyone yeah, else I, go ahead Blair. Yeah. I would jump in and agree. I think that it is important for a submitting company to realize this is your opportunity to control the message. And it is, is important mm. that you lay the data out and thoroughly lay out what your impact of that missing damaged data uh, gap is, uh, because this is the one opportunity you have to control how people are approaching that. Um, so that would be my my two cents worth is that you you put it out there and you put context around it as much as you can. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, control your own narrative uh, for sure. Um, don't let the the agencies come up to their own conclusions because it probably won't be the one that you like. It's, it's definitely a, a really important uh, take home message here. Um, so for the very last uh, question, I think for all of us, and, and maybe I'll start with Justin because. We talked a lot of problems today and, you know, and how we can identify them. Um, but I mean, a lot of problems that occur in clinical pharmacology programs, but like how can we identify and mitigate these early in the clinical development process so that they don't become issues by the time we get to filing? So what is some of your advice, Justin, based on the research that you did um, in that paper? Yeah, so one of the big conclusions um, and that came out of it was uh, we tried to also look at it in the paper was uh, scientific scientific advice or dialogue with the agencies. Um, that, I think that that was one of the biggest um, um, messages that we could try and get was have, have as you know early dialogue whether it's with either in, in Europe whether it was with national agencies or with the, with the um, European Medicines Agency um, initially um, for of course with a lot of um, orphan and pediatric medications uh, you. Or, you can have um, easy ac or re relatively easy access to the agencies and to discuss that um, th there's different pathways you can get to the to discuss with um, reviewers and assessors um, it, it is about i guess having a a, a good robust program and just and making of course sometimes you you know the resources are not there to to do a full program or you you need to um, be efficient in in the approach but those efficiencies should be discussed with um, with the agency, and I think that's probably the the, the one big piece of information is. Um, yeah. No, I, I totally agree. Um, yeah. The the other thing I think um, I see quite a bit of is lack of planning, early planning. So like after you finish that first in human study and you you've got some proof of concept and you know your DMPK, you know we can kind of start planning and sketching out programs 
right? Um, and, and use external consultants, use broader teams to review these programs, figure out how you can maybe address some of the study burden with modeling and simulation. And then, of course, once you kind of have a plan, discuss it with the FDA and the EMA and the regulatory authorities. Don't wait until pre-NDA or pre-BLA to have these discussions, because at that point in time, you're in, um, you know, uh, problem mitigation uh, strategies instead of like proactive, um, proactive strategies. So I, I would say that planning is definitely key and, and conducting those gap analyses. Does anyone else have any comments on kind of how we can avoid some of these problems and, and better prepare? Just a, a note, I've been on a couple of programs now that um, don't necessarily have a, a confirm development plan in place until they're fairly far along. Um, leads to quite a few surprises, either because there have been no confirm eyes on it, or by the time you get there, it's, we're, it's sometimes a bit too late. Um, so it's very useful to have um, a well-structured, well-thought-out, um, iterative um, ClinFarm development plan that's a live-in document that you can update as, as drug development proceeds. It's a simple way to, to try and catch and mitigate problems early. I, I agree. Um, I've also seen a lot of programs that try to go pretty far without actually having clinical pharmacology support. Um, so they fill it in with biostats and talks. Um, and uh, which I don't necessarily find to be an acceptable discipline specific coverage. Um, and people can get pretty far in development because they think if I'm analyzing pharmacokinetics and I'm creating PK parameters, I'm doing clinical pharmacology. Um, but there's a lot more to our discipline than just making plots. Um, and so for the smaller biotechs or for the regulators that are in the audience that are working on teams that don't have clinical pharmacology representation, um, and you're filling it in with other disciplines, like that should definitely be a flag with regards to probably your development program could have some issues as you get uh, later in development and, and they could they could definitely come back and, and preclude approval or filing um, at some point if you don't have that discipline on, on your team. Um, so with that, I think uh, I'll hand it back to Suzanne. I believe that we've wrapped up the question and answer period today. So I want to thank all the panelists and the speakers, um, my colleagues, of course. We're all, we have fun and we, we would love to, to help you all with your program. So um, please reach out to us if you'd ever like to discuss. Yeah, and Suzanne, I'll hand it to you. Awesome. Thanks so much, Julie. And thank you so much to uh, my wonderful Sertara colleagues. The audience asked all sorts of excellent questions and I'm, I'm sure everyone learned a lot. So just as a reminder to our audience, we will be launching a survey at the end. So please take it and let us know how we how we did. Next webinar on the series will be on November 8th in partnership with the American Association of Pharmaceutical Scientists. It will be on pharmacokinetic modeling and scientific communication expertise and how it advanced a drug program for sarcoidosis. You can register for this event on the AAPS website and you can register for all of our Sertara webinars on the Sertara website. On behalf of everyone, I'd like to Thank you for attending this presentation. This concludes the webinar. Goodbye and have a great day.